For those of you who have been away for some time, welcome home. We're so glad that you're back from up north or being sequestered at home for this very long season. Those of you who have been here each week, we're glad to see you too as we worship God together. For those of you who have been away, we have become the Amen Corner <laughs> during this time uh, when you've been apart. Um, as the choir has requested and our musicians that we be in worship rather than applause, we have found other ways to thank God for uh, the beauty and the movement of the music we share here, including being part of the Amen Corner. So thank you for that. We deeply appreciate all you do, and welcome back to you too as a choir. This morning we're going to begin a pilgrimage that will take us through the next year. We'll begin with a book study just starting in just another week and a half. It's on a Monday uh, afternoon on the book Without Oars, a journey of pilgrimage. And then we'll have a number of pilgrimage experiences in uh, 2022 as we begin to move forward, deepening in our faith and increasing our love for one another by the grace of God. Please join me in prayer. We thank you, God, for this most amazing day that you have made. We thank you that we have come to be fed by your word, to be strengthened in our faith, and to be sent into the world to serve you according to your promises and your call. Open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word among us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be an acceptable offering, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Years ago on a Habitat for Humanity work trip to Nicaragua, our little tribe of volunteers set out on a pilgrimage, leaving behind the concerns of our lives for just a little while. We set out with a plan to build houses among new friends that we hadn't yet met. But as so often happens on a pilgrimage, God led us somewhere we hadn't known we needed to go. We traveled by stages, first from Denver to Houston, and from Houston to Managua, and from Managua across the rainforest to Bluefields, which is a little village on the east coast of Nicaragua, and then onward by boat to a place called Corn Island. Though I never knew the nature of his troubles, one of my parishioners wanted to stay there at the end of the trip. There was within him a deep spiritual longing a yearning to be set loose from life as he had known it. So along with the rest of us, he journeyed by faith to what felt like to the ends of the earth, searching for a God, his God, our God, who would lead him to new life. During that trip, he confessed to me, if ever I disappear from life back home, please don't report me missing. You'll find me here on Corn Island, far from the clamor of that frenzied life where God has brought me at last to peace. Though it felt to him like the end of his journey being there so far away, it was there where he encountered God that it became the beginning filled with peace which he brought back to his life at home. When the world gets so noisy that I can no longer hear the voice of God, some of you know you can find me out west high in the mountains. There I can experience solace and be renewed in spirit to come back and serve. Or you might find me even up to camp in Maine where I know some of you go somewhere in New England for the summer. You have your place too where time slows and it quiets just long enough for you to really hear the voice of God. Like many, many pilgrimages, Elijah's story, which we heard today, began with running away. It started in chapter 17, Book of Kings, and a little bit before that, Elijah was the troubler of Israel. He spoke truth to power. And for those of you who have been away, we're about three-fourths of the way through a journey from the creation stories and the Hebrew texts all the way through the beginning of um, the prediction and the prophecy about the birth of Christ, which will, is where our story will take up when we get to the beginning of Advent in just about three short weeks. Elijah boldly confronted the danger of worshiping false gods in this story, and he tremendously angered the leaders of the land. The price for his truth-telling was tremendously great. 
Queen Jezebel put a bounty on his head for prophesying against the false gods of Baal, which were the gods of her, her land, her queendom, so she threatened to kill him. As a consequence, Elijah ran for his life, and in desolation and loneliness, he sat down under a broom tree to die. God fed him and sent him into the wilderness for a 40-day and 40-night pilgrimage that would ultimately lead him from near death back to life. According to one of our writers, Christian George, pilgrimage is a marinating process. The Bible is bursting with people who traveled forward to unexpected places. God seasoned and tenderized them, preparing them through a process of letting go that made possible the next step that God wanted them to take. Moses met, marinated in the desert for 40 years, as you know, until finally he could fulfill his purpose, which is to pass the baton of leadership forward to Joshua, who would then lead the people across the river into the Promised Land. The Apostle Paul marinated in the Arabian Desert for three years before becoming the missionary through whom God would birth the church. And even Jesus spent 40 days and nights marinating in the wilderness, dueling with the devil before beginning his public ministry. All of us have a need to take a time apart for that inward journey, that pilgrimage of faith, where God can equip us and shape us and fill us in such a way that we can go out into the world to serve. The theologian Henry Nouwen wrote in his book, Out of Solitude, of the necessity for all people to withdraw to a quiet place in order for us to go back out into the commerce and affairs of humankind. He reminds us that scripture tells us that long before dawn, Jesus got up and went off to a lonely place and prayed there. Some people have told me in the life of faith through a number of years of ministry that at a certain point in life they think God has no use for them anymore because perhaps they can't serve on the board or committee or start a new initiative on behalf of the church as they did in days past or even sing in the choir. But as long as one has a heart of faith to pray, God will use you yet, drawing to that inward place and praying for all in our community and in the world. In order to lead through difficult times, leaders and prophets utterly rely on the guidance from the power of God so much greater than themselves. Without God, the loneliness of the path ahead for them and for any of us would overwhelm. At times it would feel unbearable. Prophets always seem like lone voices crying in the wilderness. We remember the dangers faced by modern-day prophets, prophets like Martin Luther King Jr., whom we speak about often, partly because he was a pastor and a person of faith, and we can identify with the struggles that he faced internally. He reported his ordeal from a late-night telephone call during the Montgomery bus boycott. The voice on the other end threatened him and insulted him, causing him insomnia. He felt the temptation to step away from his leadership role, but he feared appearing cowardly. Moving from the bedroom to the kitchen, he drank coffee and he prayed. The response to his prayer came in the form of a feeling of unmistakable divine presence. A reassuring voice, an inner voice, promised God's support no matter what happened next. And in fact, there was a bombing of his home shortly thereafter, but he describes feeling and experiencing an overwhelming sense of peace regardless because he knew that God was with him. We see parallels between King's experience and the prophet Elijah's, the threat, the temptation to quit, and God's eventual affirmation of his future in a quiet voice when he had to let go of everything else but God. Those in power always seek to silence the voice of prophets, whether by assassination or intimidation or discrediting. Prophets don't choose suffering. 
They are, for the most part, ordinary people like you, like me. People who stand up for injustice and even knowing that they're going to suffer regardless. Whistleblowers who speak the truth don't generally win first prize in a popularity contest. For example, you may remember the story, if not the name, Sharon Watkins. She was the former Enron vice president who wrote a now infamous memo in the summer of 2001 to then CEO Kenneth Lay warning him about improper accounting methods. At that time, Enron was one of the largest corporations in the U.S. and a giant in the energy trading and utilities field. Fortune had named it America's most innovative company for six consecutive years. However, Watkins' memo revealed that the company's finances were sustained by systematic accounting fraud and corruption. Enron was forced to declare bankruptcy in late 2001, and she was called to testify before the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate about the accounting irregularities that she had found in the financial statements. It must have been terrifying. Because as the news broke out publicly about that memo in early 2000, in the early 2000s, it came to light that the company had sought legal advice about firing here almost immediately after the initial uh, meeting with Lay. The only reason she wasn't silenced and fired is because Enron imploded before the company had time to pursue its retaliatory plans. We're still in the middle of the story of whistleblower Francis Haugen who says that Facebook chooses profits over safety. Now, I don't know much about the business of Enron. I'm not in that finance world. And I don't know much about Facebook. But I do know that Haugen has provided countless internal documents procured during the two years that she worked as a Facebook product manager. And that she claims that Facebook knew that their algorithms would spread hate through social media contributing to the divisiveness of our country and some of the violence that occurred as a consequence. Whatever the outcome of this ongoing story, and I read the news or hear the news like everybody else, none of us know, whatever the outcome will be, we do know, and the point is, that those who speak truth to power may change the course of companies, organizations, nations, or even history. So we know that Elijah showed great courage in those ancient times as one of the early whistleblowers, a prophet of God in our Bible story for today. He was a famous prophet, well-known, well-respected, bold. He confronted the big lie that worship of false gods, the false gods of Baal, could lead to life. It didn't. As Elijah fled from the worldly power that wanted to take his life, he set out on a pilgrimage towards Mount Horeb. This is the same mountain where Moses communed with God, saw God's backside passing by, and received the Ten Commandments, later sealing a covenant between God and God's people. Along the way, Elijah had to let go of everything he thought he knew. He had to let go during his pilgrimage of his view of himself as this famous and much adored prophet and his belief that he was the only one left to be faithful to God. On that pilgrimage, God disavowed him of that false belief, eventually telling him, Elijah, I hate to tell it to you, but there are 7,000 more faithful up underneath you that did not worship Baal, but who are ready to be faithful to the living God. Elijah had to let go of his defeat having believed that he was doing the right thing for God, only to fear for his life rather than be rewarded for it and have to make a run for it in order to survive. Along the way, Elijah's escape transformed to pilgrimage, a journey both from something and towards something that only God could see. He traveled as only a pilgrim can, into the wilderness by stages, discovering the destination only after he arrived. When Elijah reached Mount Horeb, he hid in a cave for protection. 
And there, a series of terrifying events occurred. This story describes wind as a force beyond nature, breaking apart stones and even mountains. An earthquake followed the wind and finally came fire. The narrator declares that the Lord was not in any of these examples of power, although it had been for other prophets before him. However, all of these events contributed to Elijah's understanding that God's power was greater than any human force that could threaten him. These wild events swirled around his cave and they released him from the last of his whirling anxieties and prepared him in the sheer silence that followed to finally hear the voice of God. When the chaos had passed, Elijah came out of the cave so that God could speak to him. After the wind, after the earthquake, after the fire, came the sound of sheer silence, a still, small voice, a whisper. God spoke. Elijah listened. Only after Elijah fled from danger, only after he made a pilgrimage in the desert, only after he emptied himself of fear, was Elijah then ready to hear the voice of God and respond in action. In the sheer silence, God revealed Elijah's last appointed work, and God sent Elijah out to appoint and anoint new leaders for the Hebrew people, those who had remained and had not worshipped false gods, but remained faithful. Have you ever wanted to run away from it all, like Elijah? Have you ever wanted to escape from the pressure and problems of your life? Would you like sometimes to hide somewhere where no one can find you? If so, you are not alone. Elijah, a great prophet with a devotion to God, felt that same way. In today's story, the mighty prophet Elijah ran for it, having experienced desolation, betrayal, and pain. The prophet longed to escape from the situation. And along the way, he experienced that transformation from fugitive to pilgrim, fleeing not just from something, but to God. When life closes in around you, and it always does, you can turn to God for support. When we face difficulty, it may come from ourselves or it may come from others, from someone outside ourselves. It may be because of our disloyalty to God, or it may be because of loyalty to God's cause. Inwardly, we may wish to escape a situation or the uncomfortable or crushing emotions we experience as a consequence. We get that. Elijah did too. Outwardly, we may wish to escape opposition, most of us know what it's like to sometimes be opposed in some way. Someone threatens us, somebody dislikes us, somebody desires to hurt us or call us, cause us harm. We get that too. Elijah's opposition was real. It was a present danger, a threat. We know what it feels like to be threatened or afraid. We may have run away from something big, trying to escape the consequences of something we thought we had to do that that cost us dearly. Once we escaped that danger, we likely began a pilgrimage of our own, a walk forward by stages into a future we couldn't yet see, revealed in time by the grace of God. Remembering that time, even if it only happened once, gives us courage for the path ahead, wherever God may now lead. Now, many of us may never experience the dire consequences that cost prophets to plea with God for escape, but we do know what it's like to want out of overwhelming circumstances. God yet is faithful. When we're on our knees seeking a way out of no way, God bids us to get up and go. God leads us forward on a faith pilgrimage through our own troubles to life. 
We may start that journey by looking backwards of what we're escaping from, what we imagine is chasing us, real or not, only look to look forward to our escape towards God. The very nature of God is to go with us and to lead us forward from trouble to life. We are in such a time as that, aren't we? We've left a place, we've cut ourselves off from a mooring, a reliable, predictable life we thought we knew, and now we're in this liminal time between ages when we don't yet know what the future may bring or what it might look like. Whatever our challenge, whatever our difficulty, whether we've created it or it was given to us, we can cast our cares upon God. Scripture promises us that. And God promises to sustain us and nourish us and uphold us and support us, whatever the future may bring. This does not promise that God will carry our troubles immediately away from us, but it does promise that God will encourage us and grant us whatever we need in order to release our attachment to our troubles so that they will no longer have the power to cause us harm. Whatever our troubles, God will sustain us so that we do not fail, we do not fall under the weight of the problem until the path forward is made clear. Finally today, as you hear these words of hope and promise, know the promises of God that are revealed to us through the psalmist so very long ago that reminds us of God's presence with us now both individually and collectively as a people of God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and it will, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, and it does, though its waters roar and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still. Be. The Lord of hosts is with you. May it be so for you and for me and for all God's people this day. Thanks be to God. And may all God's people say, Amen. Amen.